Thanks. So um, thank you everybody for coming here, and also thank you for besides the city and Cerner for this fantastic space. This is one of the best spaces that I've ever seen for a B-Sides conference, so it's great. We'll go ahead and just start rolling. Uh, this talk is about Danger Splits, which was the leaked post-exploitation framework uh, from the equation group, otherwise known as these guys. Uh, but we'll be covering some of the capabilities in that framework and then how we can actually potentially defend against it. Let's go ahead and get started with a little bit about who I am. So my name is Francisco Pinoso, and I currently run a managed services architecture team at Kedelsky Security. So I'm a manager and I tell architects what to do. But before that, I was an architect at another managed service provider. I've uh, also been a security engineer, a consultant, and uh, my favorite part of my career was being a security analyst. So to give you guys a bit of background regarding where this came from, Around this time last year, April or so, uh, the shadow brokers leaked a bunch of information in one of their leaks titled Lost in Translation. And Lost in Translation included a bunch of information about a swift hacking operation against a Middle Eastern organization, as well as a bunch of Windows tools and exploits and things like that. And most researchers who dug into this actually focused a lot on the exploits. Some of the famous ones that you've heard of, like Eternal Blue, Eternal Romance, Eternal Synergy, all of those were included in this leak, but a full, fully functional post-exploitation framework was included as well. And uh, nobody really was looking into that, so I decided to. Uh, my drivers kind of for looking into this is, you know, every time we read a report or something about a breach, organizations are saying that it was an EPT, it was a very persistent adversary, and like 99% of the time it's not. But I wanted to see really what an adversary who had those capabilities and tools saw from their perspective. So often if, if you're like me, maybe you're reading a little bit about uh, nation state hacking from the other side of it, from researchers who have found just a little bit of artifacts and have reversed the tools and have understood how they worked. But there's never been a full leak like this, so I was really excited to dig into it. Also, I want to encourage others uh, all over the country and the world to start looking into this more and reverse it. There were literally gigs of data, a bunch of DLLs, a bunch of things that were included in this post exploitation framework that most people have not really dug into. So uh, this has worked. Uh, a few researchers at a few different companies and universities have uh, started looking into this more in depth, but I would highly recommend that everybody in this one do that as well. And then finally, I wanted a technical side project. Like I mentioned, I'm a manager now, and uh, you know, when I was a security analyst, which was my favorite part of my career, my days sort of looked a lot like this, you know, where I got to play around with some really deep, cool technical stuff. And then as my career progressed, uh, oh, so, is there Jessica here by any chance? Anyone named Jessica? Anyone named Jessica? Okay, sorry, thank you. Sorry. No problem. You're good. Um, so as my career progressed, my day really started looking like this. Uh, and because I work from home, I started looking like this. And then my inbox started looking like this. So, you know, to kind of keep my technical edge, I wanted to start really looking at uh, some technical things again so I could hang out with my friends and not be ashamed of how nerdy I truly am. So what we're going to cover in this talk today is kind of a brief introduction into this uh, framework and some other frameworks that were actually included in that leak. Some information about the tradecraft and capabilities about this uh, attacker, so nation state attackers, super interesting. Some methods that uh, Equation Group actually maintains persistence and gets persistence on a machine, and then does like reconnaissance, lateral movement, data exfiltration, and we'll wrap this up with a bit of information about defense strategies in general. So before we kind of roll into exactly the capabilities that this Dander Spritz framework has, let's cover a bit of the history of the frameworks. So using a lot of the metadata in these files that were leaked, I was able to piece together some of the history of what the Equation Group development team built over the years. And what we see is that there's actually a post-exploitation framework that started being developed around 2001 called Expanding Pulley, which is also included in this leak. Around 2005 is when we start seeing the very beginning of development uh, of Dander Spritz. And then 2011 
is when we see them rewrite a lot of the plugins and things which I'll cover uh, in Python. So, first of all, uh, expanding Pulley again 2011. Uh, I, I just want to thank the Equation Group developers for leaving some uh, information about dates and other things in the files that made it really easy for me to determine this. But expanding Pulley again, the very first version of this post exploitation framework. And uh, it actually used a custom scripting language. So the framework itself was written in C, it's been fully, but plugins and capabilities were written in a custom scripting language that's called EPS, Expanding Pulley Script. It's sort of a weird mixture of Perl and other languages, but it's definitely custom and uh, interesting to read. This is what expanding pulley looked like. Again, it's available, it's visible, so it's just kind of a command line with a very limited GUI off to the side that tells you what commands you're running on a specific target or machine. Then, in 2005, is when we first start seeing Dander Splits, which is again the framework that we're covering now. And at first, they started using DSS, so Dander Splits Scripts. Uh, which brought in a few more useful things like functions that you can import from other libraries and things like that, but still fully custom. 2011, for some reason, they actually started just gutting all of these scripts and redirecting them all to Python. So they rewrote them all in Python 2.6-ish. Um, and uh, again, made it really easy for us to read. So if you know Python, super easy to understand what's happening, how they leverage a lot of these plugins and some of the things that they do. All right, so getting to actual post-exploitation. So within this tool, this leak, the loss of translation leak, it's included everything that you need to go from nothing to full post-exploitation framework. And the way that that works at a very high level is there's this fuzzbunch tool, which is essentially the post, uh, or sorry, the equation groups version of Metasploit. It literally lets you like test what, um, a machine is vulnerable to, recommends an exploit, lets you launch it. And once you actually launch that exploit, it uses uh, double pulsar, which is an in-memory backdoor. And uh, this, this in-memory backdoor is extremely elegant. There's been a lot of groups that have dug into how it works, and I highly recommend you look into it. You can probably fill up a 30-minute talk on just how elegant uh, this is and how it works. But double pulsar is an in-memory backdoor that can be configured to run like shellcode or load a dynamic library or just run an executable. So double pulsar is then configured with an implant, which is really just a malicious code that's responsible for communicating with that listening post, which is Dander Spritz. So Dander Spritz is really the CNC server, the community control server, as well as the exploitation toolkit. So we go from nothing to exploit, memory backdoor, and then full post exploitation framework. A few terms that I'm going to use during this talk, just uh, to give you guys a heads up. Target is really just the attacked computer. So anytime I re reference target, that's what Danish would call it, it's just a machine that I'm attacking with this post exploitation toolkit. Uh, LP is listening post, really just uh, equation group jargon for a CNC server. So the machine that's actually responsible for sending commands to the hacked machine. A command is something that you're running on the target. It could be like, hey, look for these files, or, or more complex things that we'll cover. Uh, a PSP is a personal security product, or jargon for AV. It's really what they call AV systems. And finally, safety handler is just something that uh, prevents the operator from messing it up, which we'll cover in more depth. So, what exactly is Dander Spritz? Well, first of all, Dander Spritz is really freaking cool. I really recommend that you guys play around with this. Uh, please don't do anything dumb with it. Uh, don't blame me if you get in trouble, but it's a really cool framework. Um, just truly incredible. And as I cover this, I'd like to remind you that all of these things, the tools that I'm covering, the capabilities were from 2013. And based on my testing just last week, they're still mostly undetectable by even the next-gen security products. So from 2013 to now, still undetectable. Uh, can't imagine the type of capabilities they have in 2018. So uh, Dander Spritz is a full functional exploitation framework, full functional post-exploitation framework. And I'm talking about from the very first time you get onto a machine to full lateral movement, recon, data exfiltration, and cleanup. It's all included in that framework and available uh, unintentionally open sourced. Uh, the framework is actually written in Java. So kind of like the framework that wraps it all together is written in Java, which sort of sucks, but it's easy to decompile. And it's extremely modular. 
So actually adding a module or plugin or capability to this is super easy. Requires a few Python scripts, some XML, and you've got a module that any operator can run. And those plugins, those modules or features are actually just written in Python or that custom scripting language that I covered earlier. So super easy to read, understand what they do, and then build your own. And this framework is completely designed for stealth. So every step of the way, the framework is making sure that the operator is not doing something or custom automated scripts are not doing something that's going to get them caught. So a lot of operational security is built into this framework. And finally, it's designed to prevent dumb operators from really messing it up. And we'll cover what that means in a bit. So even if, as an operator, you try to force it to do something really loud and really dumb, it'll prevent you from doing it because it's, again, designed for stuff. So let's talk about what Dangerspritz calls an operation. An operation really is just a repository for Dangerspritz to store session data and session information about everything that happened during a hacking operation. And when I mean everything, I mean literally everything. Like it, every command that you run on the machine, the output, what happened, all that stuff is held in this repository, which can later be used uh, to generate some additional information. Additionally, Dangerspritz requires that every operation use a separate public-private key pair. So from a network perspective, all of this traffic is encrypted with a unique public-private key pair that you're, you're not going to be able to encrypt. So really, this framework, all the CNC communication is all encrypted in a way that you won't be able to tell what it's doing. And again, per operation. Uh, data sprints can actually correlate data from targets across the same operation. So if you see something on one machine break into another or move laterally to another, it'll correlate that data for you and then can register safety handlers across an entire operation. So if a safety handler that says don't do X because you'll get caught is uh, identified on one machine, you can just tell the Spritz, register that across the entire operation because I know that this entire organization is setting up the same way, the same security controls. Uh, operations can actually be replayed for what I assume is for training. So as I mentioned, Data Spritz is logging everything that you do and every command and the output and then can replay it. So built into this tool, uh, and in this leak, there's a tool that just lets you replay that operation, which I assume is for training. And then finally, uh, as part of their operational methodology, the equation group recommends, it looks like, operators write uh, what are called ops notes along the way as they're moving forward through this hacking operation. And if the op notes are formatted correctly, they can actually be used to generate text summaries which uh, looks to be generated when something has gone wrong in the operation, and these tools need to be updated for some reason. So uh, literally a tool you run it, it generates a text summary that can be sent to someone else to say, hey, go fix this. So uh, this is what data scripts looks like today. And well, today as in 2013, uh, but the copy that we have, this is what it looks like. And when you first connect, uh, Dander Spritz actually does a bunch of information gathering automatically for you. It calls a script called survey.py, which is intended to gather a lot of information about the lay of the land and give the operator information about what's going on with that machine. By default, you'll get operating system information, network information, mounted drives, uh, currently running processes, drivers that are loaded or could be loaded, Installed software and software keys for some reason. I don't know why they need that, but uh, can grab those as well. Uh, any services that are running or registered on the machine. Things like PSP, so AV systems. Uh, persistence, so Dander Spritz by default will actually look for commodity malware that has established persistence on that machine and tell you, hey, something malicious is on here. Uh, it's not another nation state, but just you know, persistence, be careful. Um, It'll audit config, so logging. If you have logging enabled, please have logging enabled. But if you do, it'll dump that configuration, tell, you, tell the operator exactly what's being logged. Uh, scheduled tasks, another common persistence method. Recently modified files, USB devices. And then they also have their own custom version of Minicats uh, that will dump passwords if the industry believes that it's safe to do so. And we'll talk about how that happens in a bit. So this survey script uh, takes a long time to run. Every, every time you connect to a machine, it does this. But it really gives the operator a lay of the land and also builds a database under that operation so that the industry knows what exactly is happening and how it should behave and use all of its other tools. 
So let's talk a little bit about tradecraft. Uh, and the tradecraft for me is, is some of the most interesting parts of this because even though this tool set was leaked, they're obviously going through and rebuilding this tool set, but their tradecraft is gonna remain the same. You know, that's something that's very difficult for nation states or any hacking team uh, to, to change. So first things first, uh, when you connect to a machine that service group runs, it also runs another tool called Territorial Dispute, which is actually specially designed to look for other adversarial nation states which have been or may still be connected to that machine. So the way that it works is that there's this signatures.py file, sigs.py file. There's about 31 of these. Uh, they're not named anything specifically, but it's looking for, you can cross-correlate known other ATPs, so like Russian ATPs, Chinese ATPs, that immediately tells the operator, hey, this other hacking team, this other nation state is on this machine. So very interesting, and uh, actually a team at the Budapest University of Technology and Commerce uh, put together a really good talk for the Kaspersky Security Analyst Summit just on territorial dispute alone. And they were able to go through the SIGS.py file and correlate all the different nation states and APT teams that they were looking for. So I uh, would highly recommend you watch that talk as well. Cool. So even though I mentioned that this is a full-blown post-exploitation framework, and that's true, what's interesting is that included in this framework, there's actually a full forensics kit. So if the operator needs to do forensics on the machine for whatever reason, maybe they found an APT that they haven't synced yet, they can grab a lot of forensic information from the machine automatically. Uh, they can like scan memory and processes and can identify injected threads by looking for a dynamic library that's loaded into memory but it's not written to disk. So very common forensics technique now, but built into this framework from 2013. Uh, they can also parse files, so 